Hello, I'm David Sturmer. I'm the Chief of Perfusion for Michigan Medicine. I'd like to say thank you for providing the opportunity today for me to come talk to you. We are talking about cardiopulmonary bypass, prime volumes, and red cell transfusions. Um, at the University of Michigan, I am responsible for the adult and pediatric hospital. And as such, we have tried hard as a blood conservation technique to take some of our techniques from the pediatric side of right sizing our circuits to our patients and applied them to the adult practice where there has been more of a traditional mindset of one size fits all um, with large variation in patient populations. But before we get going today, I would like to offer a couple of disclosures first. Uh, I have no financial interest to disclose in this uh, presentation, as well as I'd like to acknowledge Tim Dickinson, who was a primary contributor to the paper we're going to discuss today um, as well as gave a very similar presentation at AMSEX Quality and Outcomes in 2017. And he was kind enough today to provide me uh, his slides from that presentation. And I used a fair number of them, and I just want to make sure to acknowledge Tim's work and say thank you for his willingness to share his uh, collaboration and his knowledge. Thank you. So the article that we are to discuss is net prime volume and its association with an increased odds ratio of blood transfusion. As I said, this is something Tim worked on as well as myself, Josh Goldberg, David Fitzgerald, Guy Payone, and Donald Lakowski as part of the PERFORM registry, which is embedded within the Michigan Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons Quality Collaborative. Um, so as a bit of background, we are all aware as professionals and clinicians that hemodilution anemia has been cited as a contributing factor to red blood cell transfusion in cardiac surgery patients. As well, cardiac surgery patients receiving transfusions are at an increased risk of morbidity and mortality with those associated transfusions. Some of the work done in this has been done by Dr. Renucci. He has a paper called Body Size, Gender, and Transfusion as Determinants of Outcomes After Coronary Operations. And his conclusion was that female gender and small body surface area are associated with severe intraoperative hemodilution, and this may trigger blood transfusions, which are true determinants of adverse outcomes. A large body surface area in a woman as well is frequently associated with obesity and may prolong the intensive care unit stay Whereas conversely, this is not a worth risk factor in men. In fact, what we find is that men with smaller body surface areas are at increased risk of ICU stay. One of the interesting graphs from his paper is the probability of transfusion based on the lowest bypass hematocrit or the nadir hematocrit. As we would assume, the lower your bypass nadir hematocrit, the more likely you are to have a blood transfusion. This prompted the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the STS, to put out blood conservation guideline recommendation, class one, level A, that efforts should be made to minimize hemodilution by reducing prime volume. With that in mind, uh, the group that contributes to, to the PERFORM registry uh, set out with an objective in mind. They decided to assess the impact of these efforts on intraoperative red blood cell transfusions in centers that are contributing to PERFORM. Uh, if you're not up to speed on the PERFORM registry, allow me to take a minute here to acknowledge two of my good friends, Theron Pa and Donnie Lakowski. While there were many people that contributed to the uh, spearheading the increase in PERFORM registry usage, uh, Donnie and Theron were instrumental in really getting it off the ground and getting it going as a data collection registry for cardiopulmonary bypass variables and then associating it with STS case uh, as well. They put an article out in 2012 called the Validation of Perfusion Registry, Methodical Approach and Initial Findings, and basically went through the methodology of what they are trying to accomplish with the PERFORM registry. Their overall objective is to focus on the technology, circuit priming volumes, constituents, medication, um, and blood management, cardioplegia strategies, temperature and volume management that go along with cardiopulmonary bypass of management of patients undergoing cardiac surgery. 
they do this by taking STS data and perform data and merging these records. There's a few shared variables between the two registries, such as hospital national provider number, date of surgery, bypass time, cross clamp time, and date of birth of the patient. And they use these fields to create a merged record. I think as we're all aware, the STS is a phenomenal source of capturing surgical uh, occurrences for patients, but the variables associated with cardiopulmonary bypass are few and do not provide a lot of clarity around a variation in practice that can occur from institution to institution and perfusion to perfusion. And Donnie and Theron were instrumental in getting us up and running with a way to merge these records, as well as provide some more clarity to the variables associated with cardiopulmonary bypass for these surgical patients. With that in mind, the PERFORM group uh, went about designing a study to look at how prime volume impacts blood transfusions. So we designed a prospective observational cohort study our primary exposure was to be net prime. And this is defined as total prime volume minus your wrap volume. So basically static volume within the circuit minus any volume removed for wrap and or VAP in the process. The idea was to then index this to the body surface area or ML as a prime per meter squared. Doing this, we found a median mLs of prime per meter squared of 377 mLs per meter squared. And then we use this as a cut point to create four quartiles. These quartiles were less than 262 mLs per meter squared of uh, prime volume. Quartile two was 262 to 377 mLs per meter squared. Quartile three was 377 to 516 uh, mLs per meter squared and quartile four was 516 mLs per meter squared or greater exposure. With that in mind, um, we looked into PERFORM. We found that there were 21,360 patients um, that had undergone isolated cabbage, isolated AVR or AVR and cabbage during the time frame of July 2011 through December 2016. The centers that contribute to PERFORM are across the U.S. Um, a majority of them are located in the state of Michigan, but currently there are 42 centers participating and contributing data. In addition, we looked at exclusion criteria that included patients less than 18 years of age or missing an age value, and exclusion conditions that were involving procedures such as um, emergent or salvage status, endocarditis, dialysis, pre or interop mechanical support devices, such as balloon pump, VADS, ECMO, reoperation, other procedures, or off pump surgery. In addition, we wanted to look at demographics of the patients that we had in our cohort. So we compared quartile four, which are the people receiving more than 516 mLs of prime per meter squared, to quartile one, which are people receiving less than 262 mLs per meter squared on variables such as age, gender, body surface area, diabetes, STS risk of morbidity and mortality, previous MI, hypertension, peripheral artery disease, last creatinine, hematocrit before operation or last pre-op, uh, EF, medications, and surgical status. What we found is that on average, there was a fairly similar group between quartile one and quartile four. However, when you compare quartile four relative to quartile one, you were more likely to see older and female, non-diabetic, and patients having a higher ejection fraction. In addition, we looked at operative variables, such as procedure, cabbage, cab AVR, or just straight AVR, whether or not the use of retrograde autologous priming was employed, the use of acute normal bulimic hemodilution or taking a unit of blood prior to the institution of cardiopulmonary bypass, the amount of ultrafiltration used, uh, total volume added during the procedure, uh, pre-cardiopulmonary bypass crystalloid volumes, pump times, 
cross clamp times and hematocrits at various points through the operation. What we found is that again, they were fairly similar, except as I will draw your attention to, the amount of retrograde autologous priming between quartile four and quartile one were different. The volume of retrograde autologous priming was different. <clears throat> the use of A and H was different amongst the groups, as well as ultrafiltration. Or I'm sorry, <clears throat> ultrafiltration was similar amongst the groups, as was volume administered pre CPB. In addition, we found that quartile one relative to quartile two, four were more likely to undergo uh, elective and AVR procedures, as well as have a higher nadir hematocrit on cardiopulmonary bypass. <clears throat> so when we stopped and looked at our results, we looked at interoperative transfusions by the quartiles that we had set out. What we found was that people that were exposed to less prime volume, let's say 262 mLs per meter squared or less, relative to people that were exposed to greater prime volumes, were much more likely to not be transfused. Said a different way, if you were to receive a higher prime volume, let's say 516 mLs per meter squared versus the 262 mLs per meter squared in quartile one, you're at a much higher, almost more than twice the probability of receiving transfusions. So we decided then to look at it as an odds ratio and we adjusted for patients such as age, sex, race, diabetes, vascular disease, previous myocardial infarctions, ejection fraction, creatinine, preoperative hematocrit, total albumin, uh, antiplatelets, as well as procedural types and found that the odds ratio between quartile one to 262 mLs per meter squared versus quartile four was more than twice. As I recall, it was about a 17% increase per 100 mLs of increase in prime. So the more you increase that prime, the probability of transfusion went up significantly. This absolutely supports the hypothesis that the efforts to reduce prime volume when indexed to BSA indicate an impact on transfusions. Because of this, we hypothesize that there may be provider variation across the perfusionist in the PERFORM registry in this patient population. So while we looked at this and had a mean net prime volume per BSA of 377 mLs per meter squared, you can see from the graph that there is a large variation amongst providers in their typical mLs per meter squared of prime provided. This can be from a number of factors from institutional variation to circuit size to the use of RAP and VAP. So in conclusion, we decided that patients that were exposed to larger net prime volumes were associated with greater adjusted odds of receiving interop transfusions. Our findings further reinforced the importance to reduce net prime volume. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and look at site-specific data. And I'm gonna take data that we have as internal QI, QA data from the University of Michigan. Again, this is unpublished internal data, and it's part of our PDCA loop cycle for quality improvement. And it's interesting to look at this because we have about eight years, nine years of data that we're going to look at, and it actually shows a change in practice with the feedback of data to the team over that time period. So this graph shows overall transfusions for our practice from 2012 through 2020. What we see during that time frame is that in 2012, there was about a little bit more than 50-50 shot of getting blood at the University of Michigan if you came to have surgery. Over the intervening eight years, we've reduced that to about a 30% chance of receiving blood during that time. Now, is this directly related to prime volume for BSA? I don't believe that that is the total picture, but it is definitely a contributing factor because during this time we have instituted a blood management group as a quality measure that continuously looks at this and monitors how we manage and what we think about in blood management techniques. 
our director of this meeting and our uh, blood management person is Amy Geltz, who is responsible and is our adult STS database manager. So this is a look at how we use oxygenators at the University of Michigan. About 2011, we started to realize that we had a lot of opportunity to improve our practice around blood management. So in 2012, we started using uh, two different circuit and oxygenator configurations. We started using a FX15 with a 3 8 venous line and an FX25 with a half inch venous line. Um, and so you see here in 2013, kind of the split of how we use those two circuits. And then late in 2013, we added in the RW40. The reason we did this is we decided as a team that our FX15 circuit with a 3 8 venous line would be good to about four liters a minute. And above that, we would go to an FX25 with a half inch venous line. When we were looking at our data, we realized that we would probably have an opportunity to add in a third oxygenator reservoir configuration and use the smaller oxygenator, the FX15, with a half inch venous line and a larger reservoir in the RW40 configuration. You can see over time how this has contributed to our change in practice through the use of reducing the FX25 through about 2017 and using more of the RW40 and more of the FX15s. Now, I'd like to point out as well, you see an interesting trend starting in 2017 as well, that we appear to be using more and more FX25s all the way through 2020, when it is clearly the predominant auctioneer that we use, almost reaching back to 2013 levels. We'll talk about that more in just a second. <clears throat> at the same time, we were looking at our small circuit utilization, and this is where you can see an interesting feedback piece. Um, when we went to using that small circuit configuration, so the FX15 oxygenator with the 3 8 venous line in 2012, there was not a quick adoption of it amongst the team. And in fact, a majority of the team still had the one size fits all on the adult side and were comfortable saying that they were happy to use a bigger oxygenator and a half inch venous line for numerous reasons. But as we started providing feedback, you can see that in 2012, we transfused at about 66% in that patient population that would have been probably better suited by a smaller circuit. And we only used the circuit about 61% of the time. As you go forward in time through about 2016, we reduced our transfusions to about 37% in that same patient population and had our circuit utilization at about 95%. Now, as we go forward again, you see that the circuit utilization was flat for a while, but recently as last year dipped. During that time, you'll see 2018, 2019, 2020, our transfusion in that patient population remained fairly flat. So we were curious to see overall what may be driving some of these changes in practice. So we looked at our utilization of RAP and VAP. So this graph here provides an example or an indication of how often we RAP and VAP through our practice. So starting in 2011, we were wrapping about 30% of the time. As we started working on blood conservation techniques and changing our circuits to match our patients more effectively, we also worked on increasing blood management techniques around RAP and VAP, peaking in about 86% in 2016. We did see a fall off in 2017 and 2018, but came back in 2019 and 2020. Our blood management group was interested to see what that fall off could be related to. Because if you go and look at our, our numbers for blood transfusions during that time, if you remember from the first slide, there was actually an increase in transfusions around that time as well. We hypothesized that it's based in a number of new staff in both perfusion, anesthesia, and surgical faculty coming in around the 2016 to 2018 timeframe. We think that there was probably a lack of comfort in managing not only smaller circuits, but as well the RAP and VAP volume. And as we've gone forward in time, you actually see an increase in our RAP and VAP percentage 
And this is based upon team interaction, not just a perfusion decision, but anesthesia, surgeons, and perfusion discussing the case that now we're almost to 95% in 2020 RAP and VAP. So how has this impacted our oxygenator use? I think what you can see in 2018, 19, and 20 is that the team is becoming more comfortable with their RAP and VAP techniques and thus reducing prime volume per BSA to the patient. And as a result, I have a tendency to bump up to the FX25 oxygenator a little sooner than they did historically. This is a piece of the puzzle that is very interesting to us because we're also looking at a reduction in the utilization of the smaller circuit over the same time frame without a change in overall transfusions. <clears throat> so this would indicate that there's a potential to implicate RAP and VAP as a more powerful technique than circuit utilization. However, I would suggest that it is an additional technique to circuit matching with your patient. <clears throat> as indicated by our graph here, that we have now become more proficient at RAP and VAP as well as matching our patients to our circuit size and through 2020 are doing quite well with all comers in transfusing about 30% of our patient population. <clears throat> so in summary, reducing MLs of prime per BSA of crystalloid has an impact without a doubt on transfusions. This can be done via RAP and VAP and a circuit sizing combination to appropriately size your circuit to your patients. However, as we saw, ultrafiltration doesn't reduce the mLs per meter squared of prime with the same impact on transfusions. <clears throat> In addition, I think it's important to monitor your data, to monitor what you are doing as a practice, as well as contribute to a registry such as PERFORM and receive feedback that is able to then be provided to the team and impact overall practice. If you're interested in the PERFORM registry and would like your center to contribute data as well, they can be found within the Michigan Collaborative of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgeons website, mstcvs.org. And there is a link in there to become part of the PERFORM registry. And I'm sure Donnie Lakowski would be more than happy to talk to you about it. Again, I would like to say thank you very much for the opportunity today. And I appreciate the time and the effort and the willingness to work on reducing overall blood transfusions to our patients. Thank you very much.